Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? This is the Jimbo Paris Show, and today we'll be bringing on Miss Kumar Jane. She is a director of a holistic care business, and she's going to tell us about her 20 years of elementary school experience and working in these different areas, and she'll kind of skip, give us a bit of a summary on what holistic care really is and how it could be used to help people as well. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? So can we begin? Can you give me sort of a brief rundown of who you are, what you're about, and what your message is? Sure, sure. So, okay. Um, so I, uh, starting in the beginning of time, I've always been passionate about working with children and families, uh, well, especially children forever. And so I actually... Um, and I always loved uh, kind of human behavior and human mind. So I actually got an undergraduate in psychology. Um, and then I decided I really wanted to see before I pursued uh, education, a degree in education, if I really wanted to be in the classroom. So I was a kindergarten assistant and you learn a lot from being with five-year-olds. Um, and I decided I wanted to give it a go. So then I got a master's in, um, in elementary education. I taught in public school for about seven years and I learned a lot. Um, you learn a lot about people and families uh, when you work in a school setting. Um, and then I decided it was about year five that I really wanted, was starting to focus a lot on uh, the mental health needs in a way, and just uh, some of the kids who had some uh, concerns with behavior were placed into my classroom. Um, and so I think it's, everybody calls me the softy. Uh, I was kind of have a soft place for, for individuals, uh, especially children who need some assistance. Mm -hmm. And so then I got a clinical degree, another master's degree in uh, mental health. And I worked in a whole bunch of settings going from day treatment programs to uh, in a hospital setting and um, uh, also in a school setting and then a bunch of um, outpatient clinics and private practice. Hmm. And then fast forward years later, I have I have uh, two girls and I really wanted to stay home for a bit. I was still working, just uh, doing a bunch of webinars and seminars, just not providing direct clinical. It was less than 10 hours um, that I was doing at that time. And then um, fast forward a couple of years ago, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And so after her passing, I, um, she had left. Sorry to hear. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think well. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but she had created, she had written down these life stages. So she wrote down these life stages and I found them. And I believe a lot in energy work and energy healing. And so uh, I took those messages and created what's called um, a holistic care program, basically a coaching program that looks at um, birth to end of life. So it's health coaching, um, career coaching, just relationship and life coaching, all the way to the end of life. It's called a death doula when you help walk someone and their family over to the other side, um, you know, to help with the passing. And so it's basically a comprehensive program to help individuals and families to thrive. Um, and I do a lot of community outreach and partnerships and a lot of education. That was a long-winded info. Uh, info sorry. Well, let's break this down. So I'm curious to know, why did all this passion come about when you wanted to actually help the youth and people that are struggling in those areas? Where did that interest come from? Uh, interest in uh, youth that was struggling? Yes. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, and I'm glad you brought that up. My my other my business is actually called Love and Light for Kids, and I'm I work I'm servicing children, family, and um, and youth, um, and so through the co through coaching and through yoga and mindfulness. But my passion came honestly when I saw. I always I had this student that I remember, who was not doing very well. He was being um, just 
a lot of issues in the classroom in terms of learning and, you know, the person, the classes that had passed him before had said, you know, he might be this troublemaker in your class. And I always knew that troublemakers mean something, right? There's something going on with them. And so he was being raised by grandma. I believe dad was in jail. Mom wasn't in the picture. And so I actually asked my principal if I could make a home visit and I'd met with grandma, I met with my student. And I tell you, I will always remember going to that house and him being so excited to have his teacher in his home. So I bring this story up to you because I think it just reminded me that all children deserve a chance. I mean, I think we forget that behavior is Behavior is just a symptom of something else. And um, and, and being in, from a mental health background, you always look at trauma and you always look at what's happening with people and realize there's always a backstory to behavior, always. 100% of experience. And if you look, and I look at every example, definitely always a root, even with our health, there is a root problem or a root concern. I'm sorry, it's not always a problem. We need to get rid of that word or concern. No, it's just that you didn't like that word problem, right? Yeah. No, because not everything's a problem, right? Yeah, but every problem has a solution. I agree, though. I agree. Now, I'm also thinking about this. How did you transition from a more spiritual life to building your business? How did that come about? Well, that's a great question. Um, honestly, is the spiritual PR is still part of my business. I didn't have a business plan for either business. It was just, I like, I like literally my mom's life stages are the, are the um, business plan for the nonprofit. And um, in graduate school, we had to create a mock business. So for my LLC, my business plan is my, is really my mock business plan that we had to come up with. So when you talk about spirituality and in my, in my designing and running a business, uh, I can't, they're, they're, they're just so intersected that I can't even, I can't even isolate them. Hmm. And actually, if, if, if I tell you, I think most people actually would find that even the, like, especially the most successful business owners would tell you if they really reflect that they utilize mind, body, and spirit all the time in their business, if they're being really authentic. All right, and uh, how did marketing work? How does marketing work for me? Yes. So basically, I do a lot of outreach to different organizations. So right now, I just go with what the what the forces are pulling at. So for instance, I don't have a big caseload right now of personal clients. I'm seeing it's kind of dwindled a little bit, but I'm I'm having more requests to do webinars, workshops, which. I'm realizing is definitely has always been a passion of mine to provide education, but I think I'm realizing that if I can uh, impart um, some skills that can then be transcend transcended, then even more and more change can occur that needs to happen. Um, so I really, I, I take what's kind of being presented to me and then, um, and go from there. And when you're doing all this, what type of information do you take that's presented to you? Tell me what you mean by that. Do you mean? So when you're growing your business and when you're gathering your audience, what sort of information do you take from your audience? And who is your audience specifically when yes. it comes to holistic care? So for holistic care, recently it is turning into a lot of work in the geriatric elderly population. So, so I'm having a lot of work around palliative care hospice kind of end of life more right now, currently, and also um, with seniors. And my approach is often with organizations, um, a lot of organizations want me to understand their business platform or their organization. So oftentimes I'll, I'll volunteer with organizations first. 
I'll do a couple of lunch and learns. They see how I operate and then they'll sign me up for services or whatever that I can provide. So I've been finding myself, especially recently, that the mod, my, my modality is changing pretty quickly where it's more community-based, which I always thought it was gonna be. I just didn't know it happened so quickly. Hmm. But on its own, my, my, um, my caseload currently for individual clients is pretty low, but I do see the increase happening pretty rapidly where that'll build up while uh, these outreach programs are going. Okay, and let's sort of fall back into a more basic question. What is holistic? What is that by definition? Sure. So I always say that I design, I give everything its own spin. So holistic mm -hmm. in my world is mind, body, and spirit embodiment. It's the alignment of, and then if you look at the wellness model, we have to have balance in all of our arenas, our physical, our financial, our spiritual, our emotional. When you really look at everything comprehensive, and our environmental, I'm sorry, I didn't bring up that fifth one, but it's the idea of alignment, of looking at our whole selves. So for instance, we can't just look, let's say somebody's diagnosed with diabetes and everybody's like, oh, it's because of their sugar, the insulin, you know, the insulin resistance has started for them, but actually then you have to look at the root cause, right? You have to examine their diet, their age, create pre-existing conditions, comorbidity, which is comorbidity is when you have two diagnoses or two, um, two diseases happening at the same time. And especially in mental health, to be honest with you, in mental health, you kind of forget, sometimes we'll look at depression, but we won't look at other ailments. So I just want to remind everyone, like you're asking a great question about what does holistic means? It looks, it means looking at the whole person. Hmm. So looking at the whole person, that's pretty interesting because that's sort of what Chinese Oriental medicine does as well and Ayurvedic. It's always about looking at the whole picture. It's never just one specific problem. And that's why I love it so much. Our Eastern <laughs> thought, because you're right. It is all about always looking at the whole picture and okay. always looking at the root now of course you like to help people but how does this how does this work when diagnosing patients do you look more at the cause or do you look more at the effect of the condition so i'm glad you asked this question i actually don't diagnose um so i will in the health coach uh, arena what happens is there is some so i'll give you an example a physician's going to have a diagnosis that has been placed or a mental health clinician may say that coaching will really work with a particular client in addition to therapy, because I want to remind everyone therapy is very much important and coaching are very much important. But just to define therapy is looking at the past and trying to help make sense. I'm breaking it down a little bit, trying to help make sense of our present what we are, who we are, trying to pull that past to make sense. And coaching is really doing forward projection of setting goals and objectives and meeting them. So in order to have to be in coaching, you really have to have, it's called internal locus of control. You really have to have somewhat of balance in order to a, B, in coaching, right? So I have seen people and pay, clients do really well with therapy plus coaching. Some just need coaching and some just are ready for therapy and they may never need coaching or they just need to be in therapy so they can really focus on addressing trauma or addressing a diagnosis that's just been given to them um, and that kind of thing. Okay, and just to clarify, Internal locus of control focuses more on what you can control in your life. And because you focus on what you can control in your life, it makes you have a more happier and more positive outlook on your whole situation. And that's important. That definitely does help people quite a bit. Yes. Yes. So you really have to. Yeah, exactly. And how did you learn all these lessons? Did you have a teacher? Did you have somebody that inspired you, you had to have someone 
that sort of showed you the ropes when it came to yoga and mindfulness and all these different things? Was there anybody, a person of influence that kind of brought that information or that motivation to you? You know, so my dad passed when I was 12. And so it was my mom who's a single mom raising me. Right. Even though there might have, I mean, there was some family support, but at the end of the day, she's a single mom raising, you know, raising a daughter. So my mom was definitely a spiritual being. Some people mistake her. I mean, you can call her religious, but I can tell you my mom wasn't sure she did. She prayed every day, but spiritual in the sense that she she definitely had certain quotes like one of them is enjoy your time she would always say that to me when i would leave and what i take away in our passing is like right now i am enjoying my time in this present moment with you enjoy your time means like okay that drink of water that sip of water when you're so thirsty and you're aching for water enjoy that moment so it's that idea behind savoring that i feel like our elderly teach us you know and for, for me, it was my mom um, in that realm. And I think, I think in terms of mentorship, I mean, I really do think it's her. And I, and I think her idea of instilling faith in me has been so strong that I lead my life that way. And her with her passing, I've just been able to make a lot of sense of life and what it means, you know. Um, and I think that a lot of people who've had COVID-related um, deaths in their family have definitely done an internal, internal look, an internal cleanse um, to figure out what they really want. And I kind of did that in my year of grief. Like, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to do? what would my parents want for me? You know, they were immigrants, like like a lot of families who immigrate to the United States and even those who haven't immigrated, what did our families do for us? They wanted us to, each generation to build and build and build. So I carry those, those messages very strongly with me. And when you carry those messages with you, do you, do you bring also those lessons to the people that you're teaching and your clients? And we're going to get more into your clients a little bit later, but do you bring a lot of those experiences you've had into your clients or do you sort of teach them more concerning their own life, like a coach, just asking them the right questions? Or is it more of a counselor where you're actually telling them specifically what to do? So I have always believed in client centered care and I love coaching because it is about making sure that you help design a way of a, of a client looking at their world. And so, um, and I have taken so many different programs in the last two years to build my platform because again, I had a, a clinical background in therapy, but I didn't really have any in coaching and they're different. They're different modalities. Um, and the one common thread through the cancer coaching I did, the health coaching, um, the one modality that's the same as keeping the client first, person centered, and that and having a strong relationship and displaying empathy and connectivity. And so, if my story, and I do, I will be honest with you, I love coaching because if there's a need for a story to be told, you can do it. In therapy, we have to really, and it's changing. There's a little bit of shift, I think. But in therapy, you really have a different relationship. Um, and you have to be very mindful of, of how much you present and disclose of your own life. But, but at times, I feel like stories help people. Right. And so that's why I think it depends if it if in that moment. I'm so in tune with my client that I know that the story of something will help them, then I will just ask them, can I can I share a personal story with you? And, you know, when you have a good relationship, they're going to tell you, you no. Know, <laughs> one of my kid clients, I was like, can I can I can I tell you a tip? And they're like, no. 
And so I was like, no, they're not ready for either they're not ready for it or they don't they don't want it. Um so when you have an authentic relationship with a coach or a therapist um or your doctor, when it's authentic, I, I mean everyone's gonna speak the truth. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. You know, you don't like to force certain pieces of information onto people. You wanna wait for them because at the end of the day, if they want to fix themselves, it's up to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing that sort of gradually pushes them in that right direction. So that definitely makes sense. Now, next thing I want to get into is your client base now. So who would you consider your ideal client? I have a lot of people in the audience here looking at what you have to say. What do you think is your ideal client? I'm laughing because I always get asked this question in my coaching program, right? Like all of the, I don't know, the four or five that I had to do. And I always get it wrong, right? My ideal quiet client is this. My ideal client is someone who just, they're ready to change their lives. They're ready to, to say, I, I really don't want to live this way anymore. I'm, I'm tired. I want a new way. Or... I'm so excited about a new way or whatever it is, right? Sure. That they are, and and to know that they're gonna have to put some work in. It's not gonna be easy, right? So that piece of that question comes in education. I feel like we need to make sure, our mental health community needs to make sure that we, we, we educate to say that it is really, um, you know, when they say that statement, no pain, no gain. Yes. And I hate, I hate to say no pain, no gain, but like you, like you kind of have to tear yourself apart in order to, and, and not every example, I'm not gonna say this in every example, but you're asking me about what will happen sometimes with some, some folks. You literally are already so torn apart with some things that might have happened, or you're ready to do the work, and that you know that whatever's going to happen with going inward, that's just just going to be for the positive. Right. You know, you need to sort of accept yourself, look at where you need to change, have the humility to make that change, and then when you make that change, it'll lead to. Good results. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, you sum you summed it up. <laughs> That's exactly what I meant, but I didn't say it so eloquently. Yep. Yes. And when you're doing all of this, what is your ideal? I mean, what I'm saying is, what is one specific myth a lot of people have about what you do and what you are? Do they think you're what type of misconception oh, have you got? I probably don't think I'm crazy. I'm sure they think like, what happened? I mean, she went off the deep end after her mom passed. Like, what is she doing out there? <laughs> you know, um, cause some of my work, I'm not, I actually am not. Um, so Reiki, which I love is a universe, for those who don't know who are listening in, it's uh, vital energy force. And it's basically, we're all, it's a mission of light through your hands and really working on our energy field. And even though I don't practice in my, with my clients, I still, I'm always working. And I, in, in my personal world, I always get asked for requests to send some universal healing. Um, some of my pro bono clients ask for what's called distance healing. And there are times when um, through that medium, I'm able to kind of navigate in their body where they might be feeling some pain and kind of help send some energy for some pain relief. And so some people may think that's crazy, right? Crazy talk, like witchcraft, whatever. I also did a course on dowsing and anyone who knows what dowsing is, it's the using of the pendulum to help, to help, um, to help get answers. Now, many people think that's along the line of like witchcraft and <laughs> there's shows on it too, right? But these are all, if you go back to the roots of Eastern thought and actually even here in the, in, um, in the indigenous Native American population, they used to use wishbone sticks and they used to use them as pendulums. 
Hmm. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is everything that I am doing is reflective of ancestral practices. I'm not doing anything that's new. I'm just basically, and, and coaching, to be honest with you, Jimbo is like, coaching, we had coaches in our family. We had that mentor that we could go to, but as as society progressed um, and as, as the industrial age came through and as history shows us, then people started working on the workforce and we didn't have someone at home always, right? So a familial coach or a mentor within the neighborhood or the, um, it's like a good pastor or a good church, uh, someone from the church or, uh, people that often um, used to look at in the past. Those are the missing connections. And that's what a coach is, right? Somebody who's there to kind of kind of help um, a combination of just guiding, right? They're just helping to guide you along on your journey. And then you, you get released when you've done the inward work and you're your own coach, right? That's the goal. Hmm. Now, speaking of coaching, what are some of your favorite success stories? or your favorite client transformation stories? You know, to be honest with you, Jim, I'm gonna bring up the kids that I work with. We did a virtual sessions through one of, for, through my former practice, excuse me, we, we offered virtual sessions and it was after school. And we did a combination, they're called social skills groups, combined with, um, we combined it with 15 to 20 minutes of yoga. So we had one hour sessions. And I could see how the kids were literally, they were, for the for the kid who said, I'm not doing this yoga stuff, or I'm not gonna sit there and sit still for five minutes to what, by the end of eight weeks, so, uh, there was a session that was six weeks last year, six weeks to eight weeks, what, what transformed where they could sit, they could sit, they closed their eyes, they went into a different place so I bring up the group experience because one and one one on one of them was watching what was one doing on the screen. Then you literally see it's just like what happens in person. And they're like, you know, maybe I should give this a try, right? That social, that really that social idea of um, helping each other. And so when I saw that, I really realized, wow, I imparted just a little bit of skill that they can carry. And it can be lifelong because, um, you know, yoga and all came in my, for me, it started in my 20s. But for me to say that a five and six, and I'm trying to build a program for some four-year-olds, but um, the younger that we start, the better. And I um, I recently heard um, this speaker, he's, he's from India. He's a guru means teacher and in India, he was saying that his whole talk was about meditation as medicine. And he said that the goal of a parent, the biggest goal of a parent is not to teach them all these crazy skills, but really to, if they can teach them how to meditate and to just sit, that is one of the biggest gifts you can ever give. So I realized when I heard that a few weeks ago, to know that I was starting to do that with, the, with these children, I think that was my most, um, fulfilling moment. Hmm. And why is that such a big skill for children to learn? Is it sort of, do you think it has some sort of correlation or connection to why some kids are considered to have conditions like ADHD or they can't move, they move around too much or they can't sit still? Do you think that could be the solution or maybe mindfulness, other things you've mentioned? Yes, Jimbo, I do a lot of work with ADHD in, um, in a holistic way. Actually, um, my, my, uh, she's a colleague now, but she used to be my former um, boss when we, I was interning. Um, she and I do a lot of work on training clinicians about ADHD and looking at it holistically. And what I mean by holistically is we do just emphasizing about the nutrition, emphasizing how and, I, and this is not something I'm creating. This is all evidence-based practices, right? Mindfulness, and then uh, making sure that we account for their learning modalities. You know, a lot of kids are being misdiagnosed with ADHD, but it's because their primary source of learning 
has not been addressed. And some kids are also being underdiagnosed. So, so it's a really important area to actually look at what is happening with ADHD and also in terms of culture. Sometimes there's a lot of misdiagnosis happening. Um, and so the answer to your question is teaching children mindfulness, being present, just will lead to successful adults, right? Um, many people have said, you know, I hear adults say, I wish I had found this years ago when they start really. And, and I'm not even talking about meditation where you sit 30 minutes, just really closing your eyes, taking a breath, all of this stuff that makes you just um, really um, bring your body to homeostasis, right? Just like to chill out and relax in that moment. Um, for kids to start to do that early can really help them to lead really joyful, successful, fruitful lives that many of us have craved, but we didn't know how to do. Do you think there's a difference between how Eastern culture looks at health versus Western culture looks at health? And can you sort of explain that to me? Yes, yes, indeed. You know, um, I think it's changing. I think, I think our Western medicine or what we call allopathy or our traditional mass medicine, I think we realize it's not working. You know, it's just not working. We have, we have so many people in this country on an opioid addiction, they're on pain meds, they're on, they're on a lot of medication that was designed for a short period of time. They're in a lot of chronic pain. I mean, a lot of pain. Um, and so we, and then we just keep piling on the medication without looking at the root cause. In Chinese, me, traditional Chinese medicine and TCM, you always look, right? You always look to see what is that root emotional cause that's happening. And then you do a rebalancing of the chi, right? Mm -hmm. in, in Ayurveda, we're looking at what is your dosha type? What is your particular type in your body? And then those who believe in the chakras, people call them chakras, but it's pronounced chakras. In your chakras, you're looking for the balance. What's off balance? What can you do? There's a lot of work done in aura. We're finally realizing when they're how a balance of your aura plays a big role in your in your health so what i'm trying to get at actually is i think it's changing because so many people are tired of being sick and sick of being tired <laughs> so i think we're finally not saying east versus west we're saying east meets west a lot of people are going to look at china in India and even our indigenous native populations, Mexico and um, a lot of a lot of our traditional um, medicines, herbal medicines. You know, I know the big push is on cannabis right now. If you look at cannabis was used and how it was used medicinally for thousands and thousands of years. You know, um, our family is. Um, Hindu and even in the Hindu one of the, the Lord Shiva was a bong he like there's pictures of him right so what I'm trying to get at is nothing that we're introducing right now doesn't have some lineage or ancestral roots we're talking about finally paying attention to food as medicine well you know Hippocrates said food let food be thy medicine right so there's Greek Roman all these South Asian, Indian, Asian, Chinese, uh, or Japanese, all, and I'm not even Native American populations that are coming together to show that um, we can't just heal through allopathy. There's no way. Okay. And what do you think the solution to bringing the Eastern and Western philosophies together? And how are you a part of that solution? So Jimbo, this creation of the holistic life care is a combination of using different different modalities for me. So coaching is 
like health coaching and really aligning with the medical community for, to help clients meet their um, to help meet their goals, right? And work alongside with the medical community is very much of a Western model that I'm kind of realizing, right? Excuse me, some of the other, other approaches are still rooted a lot in Eastern thought about the food, right? Plant-based plant -based diet, uh, I don't like, I call it lifestyle, by the way, it's not diet. I think we need to get away from using the word diet, I'm trying to use the word lifestyle. I think people feel like a diet is because diet's a fad. This is not a fad to, to kind of try to include more plant-based in our, in our diets, oh, excuse me, our lifestyle. Um, I, I, and I, and even in anything that I do, I feel like it's a combination of both because we do live in the United States and I always want to count, but I mean, I, I have met so many people from the, from different countries now that we can incorporate both um, Eastern and Western thought, because actually most Americans are ready to embrace other parts of the world and what they're doing. I'm finding. And as you continue to move forward with this, what are sort of, what are sort of the services or products you generally provide online? Because, you know, since the climate has changed, you sort of had to adapt and find new ways of kind of drawing people into your business. What are sort of those approaches now? And you can kind of talk about your website, what your website's called, and what your products, your services called. This is sort of what I want you to start talking about. Sure. So um, during COVID, of course, a lot of has been offered virtually, but um, I realized my platform will always be a combination of both because I've been able to really uh, interact with people all across the world at this point um, using using technology. So um, I am, of course, building a lot of relationships community-wise within, uh, I am located in, in Virginia, so a lot of um, outreach in our area uh, in that way. But some of the products and services that I'm really looking at um, are specifically trying to make sure that people realize that health coaching is accessible um, and that it is a platform to help um, really meet your goals of pain management, dealing with chronic illness, you know, helping whatever your doctor has kind of recommended in terms of a care plan and really helping in that regard. Accessibility means that really working on a sliding scale um, is really important to me because I realize that accessibility is a big piece of why people don't do things. Even our professional coaching, even though I am a certified professional coach, it, the, the skills of being a life coach are pretty much the same. So um, that is also, these are all services that are offered on a sliding scale and at times even pro bono, depending on the situation. So Jimbo, a lot of the next parts of growing my platform are to find some donors who will help to uh, really help feed into the system so that I can continue to um, gain other coaches on board along with me. And even not coaches per se that are already certified, but ones that are so interested and wanna be part of the mission that I can help then because I have lots of partnerships with organizations that are great coaching programs at this point. Um, so for anyone who's like, oh, I wanna do a career change. I really wanna be involved in this mission. So I really want there to be a donor base to help building more people under, under the wing of the, uh, but that can go out and also service. Um, so I, my vision in the future, if, uh, Originally, I just thought I was going to have a wellness practice, right? I, I thought I would actually, right now, um, I do so many community-based interventions, there's no need for me to have a physical space. But now I see, diff I would love for there to be different chapters where there's a coach in different areas under this umbrella that can really help push out services. Hmm. And if they're not under my umbrella, that's fine. I don't need them to be as long as they're following this module of accessibility, 
um, that's really important to me. Excellent. So on your website, if people were to go on to there, can you sort of give them sort of a spiel on how they would navigate? Go about it? Yeah, or using your services, like what types of services those sure. are currently. Yes. So currently there is health coaching that's offered. I am a certified health coach and very shortly I will be a, a master health coach. And by next year, I hope to be what's called a national board certified coach, which to be honest with you, Jimbo, doesn't really, I shouldn't say it like this. It does. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but I actually, my goal is if, if the alignments happens with insurance companies and maybe some people who um, want coverage through insurance, then I can also take them too, right? But some people, of course, uh, we, I just don't know how it's going to go with insurance and health coaching in the next two to five years. They're really working hard on it, but we'll see what happens. Um, cancer coach support. That's a big passion of mine and just helping with, with the diagnosis, helping to make sure that the client and the family feel empowered to make sure they talk to their oncologist before making any big, big decisions. What I mean by that is if they don't want to follow conventional treatment, that they trust their intuition and follow some different modalities. So um, working with them at diagnosis through treatment and even survivorship so that they, you know, that's a big portion. And then um, of course I was talking about the death doula, death doula, um, end of life kind of terminal illness helping in that chapter helping to uh, to do all that over time um, over time I want to go ahead and add the cannabis coaching certification because the health coach and the cannabis coaching go hand in hand because we, I really want to make sure people are educated on how how and best to use CBD how to best to use cannabis and that comes through educating myself the right, you know, to, be, to provide quality care. But I, there's definitely a need for it. And so uh, that's going to be really important for me to do in the next, you know, in, the, in the next year. Hmm. I'm quite liberal myself. I don't really do those things, but I'm definitely in support of it. Why do you think this is this sort of falls in line with health and other things like that? You know, a couple years ago, I don't know, gosh, I should know what year this was. And I never pronounced it right. Because I always call it the dopamine reset reward system in our brain or the in, in, a, in a cannabinoid system that's been found, right? And so even though I I don't even need it in my own practice for myself, I, I did provide my mom CBD oil in her treatment when she had a little bit of pain. And I could see that it provides some temporary relief and course I use a lot of essential oils with her and uh, uh, I had done some Reiki treatments with her and I also encouraged her acupuncture and she loved it and she did some herbal treatments um, when her cancer had come back she went the eastern mm -hmm. eastern philosophy route the first time she went conventional western with uh, chemo and surgery but um, what I'm trying to get at is yeah, I just think it's the idea behind what is going to work best for the client. I want to be able to offer an a la carte service module. I do this even with the kids that I work with, right? Offering a bunch of things that sounds so appealing that you get to create your menu. You know, that's quite interesting because you sort of use this more of as a healing tool. And that's pretty important for a lot of people to know because I think a lot of times people will have the have a different perception of it when reality could help people and it could be used specifically just for medical practices. And how did you sort of learn about now I understand you applied it, but how did you sort of learn about cannabis and how you could use it, sort of? To be honest, I just popped it tea like what CBD oil when I was doing all the research for my mom and her cancer diet. I mean, I researched so much, Jim, but like most people who do when their family has some type of uh, illness. And I, 
you know, some things just pop in my head and I just go with it, right? I just sure. really follow my intuition. So CBD oil came in some part of my literature. It kept coming up, kept coming up, hemp oil. And I found I, my husband had a nurse friend in California, found a good distributor because I was always worried. I was always worried even three years ago. Where Where is this stuff being processed? Who's making it, right? Because you just don't know. Long story short, um, uh, yeah, and that was my first example, that personal example. Um, and now I just know that the alignment of health coaching and being a cannabis coach to make sure I provide that so that people who really are in pain and Jimbo's, there's people who are going to want it for their end of life. As a death doula, I know for a fact that I'm going to have to educate some of the family if that if a patient or a client is in pain. And I just want it to be, again, a survey to be like, this is an option on the table. You know, and really educating. And I, I need that education because I, I don't know all the ins and outs of how it really is used medicinally, to be completely honest with you. The right dosing, which conditions lie better with what i have no idea so i can't even go to saying and to be honest with you i don't want to keep referring out it's already hard enough to get people to to accept help i just had a conversation with somebody today there's a small find out window when someone's okay getting a little bit of help and the window closes really quick so i don't and especially in dire needs I want to make sure that people get the care that they need so they stay. And actually, when people build connections, they're not trying to go somewhere else, right? They're really not. So if I do just want to make it very clear, if I need to refer out, especially when it comes to counseling, because I do not provide therapy, my organization doesn't pro provide therapy, maybe over time could I get a therapist on board? That would be awesome. But we're not there yet. Um, so when I need to refer out, I do. But other than that, um, I would love to be able to provide. Well, you know, we live in a world where people have problems, and this is why you're here, right? So that should be a good thing. And you said you were going to get a coaching license as well for this. So this is definitely going to continue to help you moving forward with that sort of treatment. Yes. So I believe in certification for everything because there are a lot of people going out. I mean, they are right. They say they're a life coach. They say that they're a health coach. Their big terminology right now is a holistic coach. But but and it's like anything. you have to have good training in order to provide good care, at least in my opinion. And then the rest you learn through experience, right? But you do have to have a good foundation. So I make sure that whatever I'm providing, I literally go through the education for. So how do you think you're going to start expanding that window that you're going to help people with? How do you think you're going to help broaden that perspective? Do you think as your business continues to grow more people, such as, you know, my audience and continuing forward will be able to be more trusting or open to these kinds of things? I think so. But, you yeah, know, give me your answer. I think so, too. I really do. I'm very hopeful. Um, you know, COVID-19 has been hard for everybody. I um, I did a segment uh I did a segment on Voice of America for for a few minutes on, for parents in specific, just saying that it, we were all in, we're all in it together, right? It was just a hard period period um, for some more than others, of course. But what I'm trying to get at is, it was a stop and halt. A lot of people did a reflection. They want more for their lives. They realize life is very limited. It's not that we're here forever. And so I see people saying, "I do want things to change." for me. So what am I going to do about it? You know, um, Jimbo, a lot of people say to me, well, if they really want to get help, why don't they spend money on themselves? You know, it's hard. It's hard to invest in ourselves in coaching when we think it a might just be for people who, you know, have like can pay hundred dollar sessions. What I'm trying to say is, well, you know, 
I want it to be that it's accessible. And then they realize it's so empowering that they realize they can pass it on and we just keep the momentum going. So just keep the momentum going. So this is sort of the future you're looking at. And I mean, yeah, that's a good thing. You're, you're going to continue doing what you're doing. And it's a matter of time because consistency pays and this is what you enjoy to do. And this is honestly what's helping a lot of people because you've told me those testimonials before as well. Yes, Jimbo, I just, um, there's, I was on a podcast a couple months ago where her name's Mari Mitchell and she's an author as well and a life coach. And she has started this series called Finding Your Purpose. So she asked if I wanted to write a chapter and I say yes to a lot of things now, right? Um, I don't say no to a lot, but I say yes, I more than more than no's anymore. There's actually a book called The Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes, who is the writer for, um, or excuse me, the producer for Grey's Anatomy. And she highlights saying, using the word yes more than no. But um, so I wrote this chapter and in that chapter, I reflect on the fact that, um, I kind of lost my train of thought, but like that, we're, that life is so time sensitive, right? And and um, we all have a time stamp. We don't know what it is, and nor should we really know what it is, right? You just keep living and going. But I highlight there it is. I highlight the word seva, and seva in Hindi means service. So I just realize everything is service. And in that chapter, I say that even doing laundry is service. Even doing a podcast is service, what you're doing. Um, even me being here right now is service, right? Service comes in paid, unpaid, all types of forms. <clears throat> and the minute that you realize like service is what we are all meant to do, for me personally, that has definitely made it a lot more fruitful and authentic and a happier way to live. And you sort of talk about living an authentic life. How do you think a person sort of lives an authentic life? How do you live an authentic life? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, okay. I, I seldom do things anymore that I don't want to be doing. Right. So if I say yes, then I really want to do it. If I say no, I don't want to do it. There are times I also have to lead my life by obligation. I think it happens, but the obligations are definitely less than ever before. <clears throat> That's for sure. Authenticity for me means finding your purpose and passion, which therefore you have to go introspectively in yourself and you have to constantly evaluate. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I even was like losing my cool. I was like, gosh, I thought I'd worked through all my demons of losing my cool real quick, but I still have work to do. So it's that constant like, okay, what is my skill deficit? What am I good at? What am I not good at? Oh no, why am I doing this? Like that constant talking to yourself. People used to think that's crazy, but actually everybody should be talking to themselves more. It's really good. And we kind of hit three main topics. You know, we talked about mindfulness. We talked about holistic here and we talked about a little bit of cannabis so the next thing i want to get into is yoga now how do you sort of incorporate yoga because yoga is a little bit different because it's a much more physical practice how does that sort of work into your services and the sure. way it helps the clients so yoga for children i incorporate all of it so you just so the definition of yoga is very clear, right? It's the uh, it's the alignment of our breath, mind, and our body. That is the definition: mind, body, and breath alignment. So for children, I incorporate all of it. For adults, I've been working a lot on breath work and meditating. Going, I do a lot of guided relaxation sessions for adults, uh, and I lead a lot of webinars, uh, and I do a lot of. Um, day webinars. I'm doing a lot with a work day wellness, work day wellness, just for 30 minutes that people can just take out. And a lot of business and corporations are realizing that they're 
uh, folks need a little bit of a break so that they can get going again. Um, so I work a lot on that idea of going, um, of allowing ourselves to just follow our breath through guided relaxation sessions. And then um, I've led some chair yoga um, during my guided relaxation practices. And then of course, just doing some uh, gentle closing of your eyes and going into going inward with, with adults. And children, I do the, all the poses and the breath work and all of those components. Hmm. And when you bring all of this work together, what types of practices specifically do you do? Me? Yes. <laughs> it's a great question. Are you talking about my own practices, like what I do? Yes. Yes. So I try to stay every morning. I try my best because I also am telling you I'm human. I sometimes will err and do things in the wrong order. And then I get frustrated and I realize it's because I didn't do what I love to do, which is starting in the morning um, and taking some time. I have this book called Jesus Always. It's a passage a day that I read and it's just about putting God. God carries you just a little bit of good inward like building me up. I have some affirmations that I've written. I'll read a few of those. And then um, I'll do just a couple of quick yoga poses, but there are days I haven't followed the routine so well in the last couple of weeks, but I also know I pay attention to what's happening astrologically. You'll see what are, ha there's some shifts that happen. Then I look at my own imbalance and then I'm not so hard on myself anymore. I, I, I'm very humble and I say, okay, obviously I'm not meant to do this right now. And then Three days later, I'm back to it again. And I, so I just want to remind people that we're all human. I have, I'm, I'm, we're all works in progress. And, um, you know, you just want to have some general structure, right? And then you want to get, it's like riding a bike. You just want to keep getting back on when you fall. And this philosophy of not being too hard on yourself, how did that get ingrained into you and your lifestyle? That also came post my mom's death. <laughs> like, um, yeah, when I reflected on, you know, I think both of my parents having such chronic illness, you know, and just like, what was it? Was it that they put so much pressure on themselves? Then I thought about what am I doing to myself and not really like living happily when I'm always like, well, why am I not organized enough? Why am I always like, why have I switched so many different jobs and careers over the years? Why do I not have the 20 plus year career that many people have, you know? And then I realized I was like following the tune of everybody else. So I stopped and I halted and I was like, this is not the way I want to live, right? So that reflection. So it's pretty recent to be honest with you. It's not anything that's like long, long, like last few, past few years. And where do you see, here's another one. If someone was in your shoes, what advice would you give to them to reach the same stage you're at now? So in that chapter, I wrote, I'm crazy. You're probably crazy. You should just own being crazy. It's like, I think we always think, um, you know, my mind is always going a mile a minute now, and so is everybody else's. And you can turn your mile a minute thoughts into really positive thoughts that can be really life changing. If I can do it, you can. I mean, I have my own demons that I fought through. Uh, you know, that's a whole different story, right? Like, we all have them, our own self inhibiting thoughts. And you have to just discard them and let them go. And then if they come back, you discard them again. It's constant. And Jimbo, everything's hard work. Like if you want things to come easy to you, then that you have to change that philosophy. You know, I'm not afraid of hard work and neither. And it's not even hard work. I think. You know, you think about my, I think about my ancestors. My mom's side of the family was all farmers. You know, they worked on the heat in India, like labor, laborious, physical, demanding work. 
So, I mean, even my hard work is what staying in the, up in the middle of the night working on a program. I mean, that is hard work in the sense of lack of sleep, perhaps, but it's not that hard, hard, laborious work, right? It's just, and then when you do get so passionate about what you're doing, it doesn't even matter anymore. You just, you just, you have so much fuel in you. You don't, and if you are getting close to being halfway full, then you have to realize what's going to rejuvenate you. So you never, even if you do get to empty, then what does empty mean? So that's, you have to, and you discover that when you discover and build your toolbox, right? Of skills and going inward and resting, right? Resting when we need to. When you say everything is hard work, do you think, do you think that's just perception or do you think everything in general is hard work? Because I think hard work is good work. So I don't know how to, I don't, yeah. I don't actually consider hard. I don't consider hard to have a negative connotation. Maybe most people do. I mean, look, I don't consider this hard work. You know, I, I enjoy doing this. But, yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. So exactly. So, so it's the idea that I think most people have said life is hard, right? It is hard. It has ups and downs. That's probably what makes it so hard. Your highs are your highs and your lows are your lows. But at the same time, like I find that it's so fruitful. Even your lows, you're learning something from. Even your highs, you're learning something from. And that, I mean, it's one big ride, right? Like, I don't know how else to say it. You're just kind of going with the flow. I don't think you can plan it out. You know, you asked me where I see my business going. I don't know for hundred percent. I have some vision, but I'm just going so with the flow. I mean, Jimbo, this cannabis coaching program idea just came to me five days ago, right? Like I'm just going with, I just know there's a need. So I'm going to push forward with it, right? Yeah, it's growth. It's, you know, you're learning and you're doing new things along the way. Now, the final point I want to hit is, I don't think we went into this as deeply as we did at the start, so I want to start going into it now. It's not a problem, but you have a master's degree as well. What was sort of that journey in college of you getting that master's degree? Because we've talked a lot about more of your real world life. How was mm -hmm. more of that college life? Because that must have been a very different environment, going from being a child to going into college. Yeah. So I actually started college as wanting to be pre-med and I realized going into my first, I'm so, I mean, and then we all have these themes in life, right? I realize now, but I, I realized I don't, I think it was a chemistry, college chemistry class. I was like, I don't actually want to do this. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do this. Right. So I changed my, um, I changed my major, which most of us, most anyone who goes to school does. And I, always remember taking the psychology in class and in um, high school and really loving it and I kept calling I kept I just you know things call us and we just need to listen so psychology called me and then I got a minor in international studies and peace and conflict resolution which I do end up using those skills too even though it's not international but peace and conflict skills come up all the time in many settings very good now, this was a very good interview. I just want to sort of ask, are there any final words or any final remarks you'd like to say to the audience? You know, Jimbo, I think today you've brought the idea of, um, I don't want anyone to feel like uh, seeking out a service or get, I mean, I know we talk about getting help, but um, getting help or seeking out service or trying something out, even what I'm offering or somebody else is offering, just take a plunge. You know, what's the worst that's going to happen? You don't like it and you don't have to do it, right? Most things nowadays you can try out. So do a survey, you know, if there is something that's out there that's long-term and you have to commit to it, then be, then then really look inward and think and ask yourself, do I, do I want to really try this do, for the long term? You know, and start asking yourself questions. What do I really want? What are my skills? What are my deficits? 
Mm -hmm. areas I want to improve. And I think don't be afraid of talking to yourself because everybody does it. I think people don't acknowledge that we talk to ourselves. So start talking to yourself. And when you're ready, know that there's lots and lots of people who are out there to help serve in different capacities. And don't be afraid of taking their hand to help you out, you know? All right. Well, thank you again, Ms. Kumar Jane. Thank you for having me.